The mission of the Declaration Center is pretty simple. It's simply to ensure that students and faculty and citizens across the state of Mississippi have an opportunity uh, to think about freedom in a careful and academic way. Now, oftentimes when I tell people uh, that the mission of the Declaration Center is to study freedom, the very next question they ask is, well, what do you mean by freedom? Uh, what does that mean? And that's a really good question uh, because both now and in the past, freedom has meant many different kinds of things. Um, and I think one meaning in particular will be apt for uh, the lecture this afternoon. Um, at many times in history, uh, freedom has meant being a certain kind of person, uh, being a person who had self-control, who had uh, desires in check, uh, appetites uh, well-ordered, um, or even someone who is free from sin. It's in this tradition that people will say it's the truth uh, that makes one free. That is, there's a certain kind of enlightenment, right, uh, that brings a certain kind of psychological composure. So now, if you, if you believe there's something to that, uh, that freedom means uh, being composed or having composure in some way, uh, then maybe you'll also agree with me that in contemporary society, there's a lot of unfreedom uh, uh, going on. Um, it does seem that a lot of people in contemporary society have a difficult time uh, maintaining their composure, especially uh, when it comes to having difficult discussions or engaging in difficult kinds of dialogue. Now, there's a lot of things we can do about that. Um, here at the University of Mississippi, I have a number of uh, fantastic colleagues who are hard at work making sure that students and faculty have opportunities uh, to engage in dialogue uh, and discussion. Um, and I can say that the Declaration Center will always accept an invitation uh, to participate in those kind of difficult dialogues and discussions. Uh, but the other thing we can do uh, is invite uh, prominent scholars here to the University of Mississippi to help us better understand how to engage in conversation and how to think about dialogue. And I can't think of anyone better to do that, uh, to do that uh, than uh, Dr. John McWhorter. As I'm sure uh, you all know, uh, John McWhorter is a renowned linguist who's a member of the faculty at Columbia University. He's the author of over 20 books uh, and any number of uh, journal articles. Uh, and he's also one of the most important, articulate, and um, prominent uh, public intellectuals in America today. Um, so please help me and uh, let's welcome uh, John McWhorter to Mississippi. Thanks, folks. Thank you for hearing what I have to say. Thank you for inviting me to Ole Miss. It is lovely to be here. I don't want to talk for too long, but I want to address what is these days often being called our problems speaking productively across the divide because it really is an issue. We are at a particular time in American history where it can be difficult, and I would venture that we're having a harder time with it now than we perhaps ever have because of certain developments beyond the mere issue of discussion. And I would say, if I pull the camera back and look at the situation as dispassionately as I can, that a key factor, a uniting factor, in what is making it so hard to talk across political divides, cultural divides, is that our culture encourages a certain kind of resistance to modernity. Now, that sounds like the title of some thesis or something like that, and I don't mean it to sound like that. It's actually something that explains a lot of things. Modernity, as in being an actor in a large and diverse post-Enlightenment society, is hard 
It's hard to be a person in, for example, these United States of America. It's much harder than it would have been to live with, say, 150 other people, the original situation of humanity, where all people are known to one another, where it's impossible not to know your place in the scheme of things. That's how our cognition began. And now we're dealing with modernity, and it's difficult. And we often resist it these days. There are a few tendencies that one sees that, for example, interfere with discussion. So for example, anthropomorphization runs rampant, and it gets in the way of productive dialogue. Anthropomorphization, what I mean by that is a tendency to see things as if they were people rather than general factors, to see phenomena as if they had agency of their own rather than being factors caught up in a dense network of interacting, interacting phenomena. And so, for example, there's a book I recommend by Robert McCauley, or if you don't want to read a book, read an article by him where he talks about the difference between religious and scientific thinking. Religious thinking, this is not about organized religion or the like, but religious thinking, and this is the first and easiest and least modern kind of thinking, is that which casts things as agents, as people when they're actually objects, that sees a phenomenon and supposes that phenomenon is being driven by people. Or, for example, gods and the like. That is the way the world looks at a certain point in human history. Scientific thinking pulls you away from that. Scientific thinking gives you a certain objectivity, gives you a sense that all things are not driven by human actors, that the weather is not driven by human actors, etc. Anthropomorphization is understandable, and it has its uses, but it's something that ideally education and modernity urge us to pull away from. But the way we discuss many things in society today anthropomorphizes. I have never been able to say that word. And so, for example, I'm going to take an example with race. Often, you'll be told, if you're learning about how racism works in America, that there are things that white people want. It's something that you'll hear, frankly, in many classrooms. There's an idea that there are white people in America, and white people want certain things, are conscious of themselves as white people, and circle the wagons when their whiteness is threatened. All of that sounds good, but none of it corresponds to anything going on in actual society where there is great diversity among white people. And it would be very hard to say that there is a set of things that white people want once you get beyond the rhetorical snap of it. The idea of discussing things in that way is a kind of anthropomorphization, which is not helpful when trying to figure out what's actually going on in our society. It's an unmodern way of thinking of things. And we're encouraged too often to suppose, especially with the Manichaean sense of society that we're often given these days between good and evil, we're, we're, we're too often encouraged to think in that way. Another example, objectivity versus subjectivity and the tendency for that which begins as objective activity to drift into something that's more about the individual and their feelings. This is something that you see in how language develops. This is something that you see in much philosophy. And once again, it's something that modernity teaches you to hold off from as much as you can. The idea that it's about you and what's inside you rather than acting on society. And so, for example, um, Richard Rorty is good on this, and he had a book, his best, I think, is Achieving Our Country. And in Achieving Our Country, he criticizes the left that he was writing about in the 80s and 90s as having drifted into an idea that politics is how you feel, that what's important is that you feel a certain way, that you represent something, rather than you actually going out and trying to do it. And so the very phrase, these are my politics, that's not the way Emma Goldman would have put it. That wasn't a, a way of putting it, say, 100 years ago. These are my politics, my politics are me, and even the personal is political. This is a matter of objective, as in having goals in society, such as grassroots efforts, as opposed to subjective, which is about what's inside of you. To the extent that we're encouraged 
to think in that subjective way rather than the objective way. And there's an awful lot of that today in, for example, educational philosophy, the way we're encouraged to think about power differentials, the idea that what you feel cannot be contradicted, your feelings have to be treated as fact. All of that is a way of thinking that ideally we would resist. The subjective is rather easy. We know how we feel. The objective takes more work, just as the scientific mindset takes work. Then there's a third tendency that we see. And so you have the anthrop anthropomorphization and you have the objective going to the subjective. Then there's something that's called the, the victimization mindset. It is a really dangerous thing and it's even more dangerous in that it's not often talked about, it's not often reified, but psychologists know what it is. The victimization mindset is a very modern way of addressing one's own victimhood, one's own obstacles, where your very identity is centered around your victimhood. The older way, and I'm not saying that the old days were wonderful, they, they weren't in most ways, but the older way when you were dealing with victimhood was that you were told, and you still are in many situations today, that you try to overcome victimhood, that you make the best of things that are trying to hold you back, that you minimize even, very common tendency that psychologists are also familiar with, you minimize what is holding you back in your mind. You almost don't want to admit that you are being held back by something. That used to be considered the regular way of being a proactive person. A new way that we're urged to think of things, though, is to think of the victimhood as central to why you're alive, to the point that you might exaggerate your victimhood, to the point that you might minimize the victimhood of other people out of a sense that for yourself to be truly acknowledged is to have your victimhood placed front and center. That, again, is a kind of easier way of dealing with things than trying to rise above them. It's another one of these tendencies that makes modernity difficult. These three things, these three things that are antithetical to what productive modernity should be about are, I think, not only rampant these days, but they're often encouraged by people who are responsible for educating young people. They're, th they're thought of as things that are in advance, rather than what we could see as a march backward. And I think that a lot of the reason that these things have come so front and center lately is social media. And what I mean is that in 2009, Twitter and Facebook became default. It's something where if you lived through it, you didn't notice it. But that was a seismic development that year. It was 2009 when it became, oh, you're not on Facebook, rather than are you on Facebook. In 2009, your mother was on Facebook. That happened that year. And social media is wonderful in many ways. But it does tend to bring tribes together. It does tend to whip up easy feelings as opposed to ones that are about reflection. And if you live on those social media platforms, and I certainly am hardly unfamiliar with them myself, the truth is, especially if it becomes something that forms the grounding of your being, if you've been on those for most of your adult life, then it's antithetical to constructive dialogue often. And that's either side of the political spectrum. And I think, as a result of the magnifying of these three things, the anthropomorphization and the emphasis on the subjective over the objective, and the victimization mindset going from being one personality type, the noble victim, to being urged as a general coping strategy and sometimes even basis of ethnic identity, those three things being focused by social media end up creating a particular snag. We have a major snag, which is an assumption that underlies an awful lot of what people call their politics and makes it very hard to have real discussions. And that is a sense, rarely spelled out, but very much, very much alive, that overturning differentials in power must be front and center in all endeavor. No one puts it that way, but a lot of conversations run aground because someone on one side or some people on one side assume that if you're not overturning, questioning, or challenging differences in power, then you're not being a good person. 
And especially since 2020, we have heard from many that that should be at the center of all endeavor. Now, I think most of us would agree that battling power differentials is an important thing. Power corrupts. There is great injustice in the world. There is great injustice in the United States. But the idea that overturning power differentials should be at the very heart of, for example, a subject of academic inquiry, that overturning power differentials should be at the heart of one's politics, at the heart of all that one does, that is a radical proposition which is often treated as something unquestioned. Now, why overturning power differentials as opposed to, say, the 35 other things that, for example, an institution might be devoted to? Where do we get to the point that there are certain people who are so focused on that one thing? Well, it actually makes sense if we are encouraging a sense of the anthropomorphization, where there are these things happening that are being driven by individuals rather than the passive way that social history actually works. The subjective focus is important because it encourages you, combined with the victimization mindset, to concentrate on the idea that there are people from above above, factors from above that often are thought of as having brains like people, that are forcing you down and forcing other people down, that focus on power differentials falls out naturally from these, frankly, and actually ironically, rather anti-modern views. And so you wind up with peculiar situations today, such as diversity, equity, and inclusion organizations that are you know, mushrooming in institutions with the idea being that even a physicist should sign a statement talking about how their, how their academic endeavor is helping to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion. The idea that this DEI should be at the center of all institutions. I think a great many people are saying yes. I understand that we need to battle injustice, but why does it have to be the very center? Why does it have to be the very focus of so much? And I think that that really has become a hallmark of the 2020s, that particular focus. And it falls out of these anti-modern tendencies. But the problem is that one can be interested in battling power differentials without thinking them as needing to be absolutely central to all endeavor and still be classifiable as a good person. Many of our discussions that run aground are predicated upon the idea that that's not true, that you must focus on power differentials as opposed to the 34 other things that we used to think were also important. And then there is also um, a general sense. There's the whole issue of the power differentials. And then I wanted to see how far I could get without looking at notes, and that is as far as I got. Okay, and then there is also the general idea that to disagree with someone must come either from naivete, and so the person didn't know what you know, or it must be that the person is evil. That can seem almost a childish assumption, and yet a great many very intelligent and very well-meaning people generally are given to thinking that if another person doesn't look at things the way they do, and if you fill them in on the information and they still don't see things the way you do, then they must be bad actors. The idea being that such a bad actor could exist. And so all of it posits a degree of evil in society that is actually relatively counterintuitive. How many bad people could there be? But if you're convinced that if a person doesn't think the way you do, it must be, if they don't agree with being given the facts, that they're evil, then this sort of thing makes sense. And so, you know, I'm talking about subjectivity and look at how everything is going to be about me. I learned when I started commenting on race, which was about 25 years ago now, that there was a general assumption. I had never encountered this before, but I learned it gradually. People generally assume that because my views are not hard left, and often were mistakenly considered conservative, although I'm not a conservative, I'm a cranky centrist. But many people thought that if my views weren't hard left, I needed to be taught. I remember there were various very well-meaning people, a little bit aggrieved, who thought that I didn't know X, Y, or Z. They would recommend books, they would tell me about things I already knew. And I would say, well, yes, I know, but I still think X, Y, or Z. Their idea then was that I must be some sort of shifty creature who's trying to get attention or trying to make money, et cetera. And this was very, very common. And among smart, 
kind people. I remember some who you could tell they weren't given to assigning evil to people, and yet they watched me doing what I was doing and genuinely couldn't understand that a person might differ on race issues without evil being the reason that they feel that way. So it's a, it's a natural thing to suppose that it must be evil and let, if, you don't, if you have the facts and don't think the way they do. But it's also, it comes from this anti-modernity, the idea that there could be that many evil people. So I find myself thinking that um, in order to talk across the divide, it would help if we thought mostly about two things. And I have found in my time trying to convince people to think more like me, if not completely like me, that these are things that are important when having a productive discussion with, with someone else or another group of people. One of them is that most issues don't lend themselves to being about either on or off. It's not quantum physics. Usually what we're dealing with in terms of people and their disagreements is differing priorities. People rank things differently. And so the issue is not, for example, why aren't you concerned about racism, but why do you rank racism lower than I do? And that's a more productive way of having a discussion than supposing that it's always about either the other person cares about something or doesn't, the other person is dismissing something rather than everybody having a different set of priorities, depending on their experience, depending on their general leanings, depending on what kind of personality type they are. And so, for example, in the world that I live in, which is um, the Upper West Side of New York, although I don't live there, but I might as well, and I teach at Columbia, and I hang out with educated people, mostly in the humanities and the social sciences, it's generally assumed that to have voted for, for Donald Trump must come from a truly, truly difficult place. In my world, very, very few people voted for Trump. And if anybody reveals that they did, then the general response is a, a shudder, the idea being that the person must be broken in some way. And very often, the idea is that if you voted for Trump, then you must be a bigot. You can argue that he's a casual bigot. If you voted for him, then you must be a bigot as well. And the truth is that if you actually speak to many Trump voters, interact with many Trump voters, that that's generally not the case. They rank his bigotry lower in the scale of whether or not they would vote for someone than you do. But it doesn't mean that they're not concerned about racism in other ways and for other reasons. To think of a Trump voter as automatically, by implication, being X, Y, and Z, is a, a sloppy kind of thinking when really most disagreements are about why do you think this thing is less important or more important than I do? And after a while, you just start to get a sense of what the diversity of people's views can legitimately be. So priorities is something that I think about more than thinking about oppositions between, for example, good and bad. Then there's something else, which is that um, the idea that a person must be bad in some way is, again, a, a rather primitive kind of thinking. It, it makes too many people into cartoon characters. Evil is rare. There are evil people, but it should be one's very last notion in assessing a person who one is in a debate with. There just are very few people who are that awful. So, for example, black conservative thinkers, there are some. And you learn when you are a heterodox thinker, as I'm told that I am, that it's generally thought that Republican conservative black thinkers are doing what they do in order to make money. They're telling white people things that white people want to hear, as if all white people wish to hear certain things. And then they are doing it to make money. That is generally assumed it's what people actually think. Again, I had to learn this because I'm a very naive person in many ways. But about 25 years ago, ABC sent a reporter to do a story about me. And you know, we did a kind of a, a friendly interview. 
And then as soon as the camera went off, the reporter, who was a, a black woman, was saying, and so, you know, I guess um, you're, you're getting what you want, huh? And I said, Carol, tell me. I can tell that you're actually going to give me a straight answer. What is it that you think I want? What did you just mean? Because all of us always talk in shorthand. I said, why do you think that I'm saying these things? Why do you think I wrote the book? And she went like this. And she really meant it. She thought that I was trying to make money by saying things that I didn't really believe. Many people think that of the leading black conservatives, such as my sparring partner, Glenn Lowry, such as, um, such as Clarence Thomas. It's always thought. I've met all of those people over the years. I've met most of them more than once. I've listened to them tell their stories. And I disagree with a lot of them about a lot of things. I have never met this Uncle Tom sellout that people talk about all the time. Smart, kind people talk about all the time. That person doesn't exist. Or if that black conservative does exist, they are very, very rare. Candace Owens is not a grifter. She believes what she's saying. And so, the idea that evil is everywhere is something I find anti-modern and unconstructive. People who are ill-meaning in that way. One has to wonder, who would marry such people? Who would be friends with such a person? What kind of psychological portrait are we imagining? That person has children. What do their children think of them when they get older? That would be a really unusual and perverted situation. And therefore, it's the last thing that I would expect of any black thinker, whether I agree with them or not. And this, of course, extends to how people feel about any number of things, the way, for example, abortion is often talked about. I do not believe that people who are against abortion are necessarily against a woman's right to have agency over her own body or dedicated to maintaining the patriarchy. There might be people like that, but that is a last ditch analysis that I, I would have. And so it's about priorities, and it's not about evil. And I think that one thing that I at least have always enjoyed in difficult conversations is the assumption that we're not going to change each other's minds. The idea is not to conquer one another, but to just learn how a legitimate person might think about different things, because that's part of the wonder of people and the wonder of the world. And so you're not going to change people's minds, or at least minds change very slowly. But the idea in these sorts of exchanges is to learn why someone thinks differently than you. And that alone can be a very valuable experience to have. I certainly have enjoyed it for a very long time now. And so I think that um, we need to realize that um, undeniable truth, the absolute truth, is something that has eluded philosophers for millennia at this point. And I don't think any of us can claim to ever get close to it. And to truly respect that means that in our discussions, we have to understand that there are very few things that lend themselves to the phrase, well, all I know is, as if therefore you know, it must be true. Things that are interesting rarely reduce to things like that. My, um, I remember I was a fact brat as a kid. And my mother would have parties, and she'd invite the undergrads over. And when I was about 9 or 10, I, I asked her, I said, Mom, what, what is college for? Because I could tell even at that age that most people are not nerds, that the people who were you know, drinking beer at our house, they didn't know what the capital of Minnesota was. They weren't talking about Martin Luther. That wasn't what they were doing. And I didn't think they were stupid, but I remember thinking, what is it that they have that high school students don't have? And my mother said, yeah, you're right. They're not learning concrete facts. But when someone has a college education, they are more likely to understand that in discussions, everybody isn't going to agree. She said that if you haven't gone to college, and she was overgeneralizing as she often did, but she was on to something. She said if you haven't gone to college, then very often what people like to do is sit and agree with one another. She said if you've gone to college, you can disagree constructively because you have enough perspective on the world to understand that issues are complicated. Facts is one thing, but that general perspective, she said, is what college is really for. I think that was very wise, and I always try to carry that with me when I am engaged in debates with people who don't think like me. So 
going, crossing the divide, managing the divide in terms of conversations these days is difficult. And I would say in closing that there are the priorities, that's important, evil being rare is important, and realizing that you're not going to change people's minds is important. But a codicil to all of this is that there is, particularly these days, and especially since about, it was starting in 2019 and then really got pushed over the edge by the pandemic and by the murder of George Floyd and by all of us being lonely in our houses, by so much thing, so many things taking place on Zoom and Slack. And that is the unspoken idea that power differentials are everything. And the truth is, they're not. They can't be. The world is more complicated than that. And in a productive conversation, I have often found that it's useful to say part of our problem here is that you're assuming that that is at the very center when I would say that is important, but that two or three other things here are equally important. And I hope you'll understand that my not ranking power differentials as high as you doesn't make me a bad person. Most people understand that if you put it that way, but you have to identify, you have to reify that that is what's making the conversation difficult. This is especially true with debates in and around universities, which of course is what I know best. But making people understand that battling power differentials is not the heart of everything and that to not consider it the heart of everything does not make you a bad actor can cut away about 40% of the undergrowth in a messy conversation, then there is more work to do. I'm going to stop there. I hope some of those thoughts were constructive, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you. All right. Well, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll uh, bring the mic uh, over uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, two questions about modernity and the modern university. Uh, diversity and inclusion doesn't seem very diverse and inclusive. And modern universities seem very tribal to me. That is, they, they take one point of view and not another. And it's no longer thesis versus antithesis. It is agreement. And it's social justice, not the pursuit of truth. When did these things happen? The switch from the pursuit of truth, thesis versus antithesis, balance and, and a diversity of faculty of thought, not mm -hmm. of skin color. When did you start to notice that? And could that be a part of the problem of this anti-modernity, the modern university itself? Um, what you're talking about is a real problem. And even 30 years ago on college campuses, there was an idea that universities were being taken over by tenured radicals. That wasn't true then. There was a certain kind of professor who had that kind of hard leftist radical view. And it was good to have such professors around because a lot of what they think is, is true or at least interesting. And it was easy to think that that was the whole campus because those people tend to stick in the mind because Judith Butler is famous, et cetera. But tenured radicals did not describe what universities were like in, say, 1995. What has happened lately began particularly in the 2000 teens, and a lot of this had to do with social media. A lot of it had to do with students who were growing up with phones and social media, where that kind of tribalism was encouraged. Also, the encouragement of embracing and exaggerating about victimhood rather than coping with victimhood. That all started then because of this intensely studied generation of kids who came up in the teens. And you know, life changes slowly. It's easy to make fake history where things happen all of a sudden, but I can definitely say that at a time when I was less interested in these things, it was in the fall of 2013 that I noticed a difference in the students at Columbia, where various things happened all of a sudden in one semester, where I started asking other professors, do you notice that there's something wrong with the students at this point, that it, it's harder to get a class going? And that was because they were the first generation coming who had grown up under this. And then 2020 really pushed it absolutely, frankly, over the edge, if you ask me. And so yes, most well, no, I'm not going to pull back on that. Most of what most DEI programs are about is tribal. All of it seems like something somebody would have done in 1850, except because it's about race, it's supposed to be somehow different. But the thing is, often when things are about race, they are not especially different. There are, you know, there are many tragedies. So, uh, Hi. Uh, so kind of context, I'm a 20-year-old uh, public policy accounting double major. Um, and in my public policy classes, 
I'm hearing a lot of what you say. Uh, a lot of the professors are kind of taking le the lead, making sure that the students are not only aware of each other's differences, but have a thoughtful and constructive dialogue when talking about a lot of these critical issues. But with my accounting uh, peers, uh, there is no sense of that um, understanding. Um, and my question to you is, kind of, as you mentioned before, this new age of like this Zoomer youth is being raised on the internet to where they have access to all of this tribalism and all of this, um, you know, this global echo chamber in a certain way. Um, where do you suggest the solution begins? And then how do we reach that solution? Well, these things change slowly. And I think that it's already at the point where when I think social historically, 2020 and 2021 were a different time than 2022 and 2023. There's been a pushback against the extremes. And in terms of how a culture changes, how intellectual history happens, there are popular books. There are popular podcasts. There are views that start getting more attention in mainstream organs such as the New York Times or National Public Radio. These things change gradually. But then also... I think we always have to understand that the world will never be anywhere near perfect and that some people on that are always going to be more enlightened than others. One would just hope that especially going through an institution of higher learning, you would at least drive by these sorts of perspectives. Things change, and sometimes we don't know why, but change generally happens slowly. And I see it. I see it happening. I think the, the I haven't heard Zoomer until now, but I think... There's hope for the, for the Zoomer generation. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. This has been a really interesting talk. Um, you. you mentioned a couple times that um, power differentials might be an important issue, but not one of many issues to talk about. And I, I guess at the risk of uh, at the risk of giving away my my political tendencies, what else is there that you think are really major issues we should be discussion discussing in addition to power differentials? That's an interesting question, and to be honest, I saw you wince when I got to that part. And so, um, for example, the climate. I mean, it's, it's huge. We're all going to die, and <laughs> frankly. And I, I find myself thinking more about that on some days than how power can be abused and, and differentials in power. Art. What makes good art? What makes good music? Why is a book good? apart from what it has to say about power differentials. We are teaching a whole generation to think of art as being only about whether white people did it or whether black people did it, et cetera. And it's just, I find that it's making us less aesthetic and therefore less intelligent. And so one wishes to think about art. One wishes to sharpen one's logical abilities. And you can do that in various ways, such as engaging with philosophy and the like. Power differentials are not going to be the only part of sharpening your mind in ways like that. Philosophy. Why are we here? What is the point of this? Is there a point? Who has had the most to say about it that we might be able to use? And so you make your way through the work of Kant for example. I'm just bringing him up randomly. But overturning power differentials is only a sliver of what Kant is about. So for me, it's not that power differentials aren't important. I think that we live in an era when we are more aware of how power can corrupt and how power can destroy lives in a way that makes 1925 look very primitive. But I think it can be taken too far. I don't see it as the fulcrum of everything the way some people do. Do you? Uh, no, I, but uh, I do think the concentration of wealth, um, maybe which I would take synonymously as uh, the marches of power, is really dangerous. And I see them as interwoven in other areas. That's a point. Um, but I, I think you're talking really It's just that there are many things. You know where it comes from for me? I was a Montessori kid. And it means that they throw you on the floor and there are all these activities and you choose what you want to do. That is how I went to school. Why my mother paid for that, I don't know. But that is what I did. And so to me, life is a smorgasbord. And then as I got older, I realized I'm in this university where all the professors who like what I do think that we're here to battle power differentials rather than to be curious 
That frustrates me as if I was like seven and somebody was taking away my toys. That's where it all comes from. There's a world out there. Yeah, questions over here. Uh, uh, so I, I have an audible version of woke racism and now I'm trying to figure out how to get that autographed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've never listened to it. <laughs> Uh, so the question, uh, referring to that book that's related directly to some of the things you're sharing, uh, it, it, this, as I read it, I, would, I noted that there was a, at least a perceived projection of a fairly low view of religion, and yet when I talk to Christians reading it, they are saying this is, they're embracing it, they're identifying with it, they're agreeing with it. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have encountered that before, if that's surprising to you, what your comment is. That's an interesting question. Yeah, um, it really does come out in woke racism that religion gets on my nerves. It, it does. And I hate saying it, especially as a black man, because Christianity is so central to black American culture, but I am a, a, an atheist, not an agnostic, but an atheist, and I wish more people were. And that's something that I kept largely to myself until that book. Now it's on my Wikipedia page, McWhorter is an atheist, but, <laughs> which I have never touched, but I noticed that they put that on it. Um, actually, to tell you the truth, the most pushback I've gotten on woke racism has been my impatience with religion and then the fact that I clearly don't like religion and then I'm comparing all of these good-hearted leftist people to religious zealots, etc. I've heard nothing positive in that way. What I do get is mail from religious people who say they wished I hadn't pushed so hard on religion, but maybe they agreed with other parts of the book. But yeah, if I wrote woke racism again, I, no, it would be exactly the same, but I would, I would know that people were going to have a problem with the religious question. Yeah, I wrote that book angry. I wrote that book in about 10 seconds. I drank bourbon, I was sitting on a porch, and I just went broom. And so I didn't filter myself, and that's part of what you're, you're seeing in that book. Hi, a uh, question over here. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what you were talking about with victimhood. Um, I see that in a lot of communities. Uh, as, as a queer person, I see a lot of, of people in my community tending to bubble and getting into the tribes that you talk about. And a lot of the, the focus on the trauma of, of growing up queer in conservative communities tends to dampen other parts of personalities that could, could grow and flourish. So I'm curious, as concerning as these bubbles are that, that damage parts of us and damage what we could become, safe spaces are very, very important to, to growing as people and recovering from from trauma, so how, how do we find a healthy medium where we don't bubble too much, but we still have a space where we can be comfortable with what, ourselves? I like what you said about the growing and all the things that a person can be, because I think that bubbles are useful in protecting people from genuine trauma, from the sorts of things that people are gonna say to you and things are gonna do to you, but Bubbles also, and I don't mean any bubble that you're personally in, but a bubble can be anti-modern anti in that you're seeking that sense of place that an indigenous person living in a rainforest has without having to think about it. In small groups of people, I'm told by several anthropologists, there is no such thing as depression. Nobody who lives in a group of 150 people goes up and sits on a hill and looks at the sunset and wonders what, what it's all for. You know what it's all for in those communities. Depression starts as societies get larger and we lose our sense of where we fit in. And so that's the danger of a bubble. And so my general feeling is this, and I hope I don't step on a toe in saying this. A bubble is great if you're protecting yourself from something real, and there are real things. A bubble is a problem when some people are given to perhaps maximizing or exaggerating what the trauma is because it's comfortable to have a crowd. It's hard to step out of that crowd and join a world where you may not feel as connected and you have to emphasize your individuality. Individuality is hard. And so I, I know the situation you're talking about, but what I'm thinking about, for example, is that um, sometimes, and I don't know the situation at this school, particularly this school where we are with its history, but for example, at my school, Columbia, I would tell a black student who said that they need 
a special dorm in order to feel comfortable. In 2023 at Columbia, I tell them, I don't think you do. I, I think that you maybe would have around the time when I went to college, but it was fraying even then in the 80s. And I would tell them now, no, no, I mean, okay, the occasional person will say a certain thing, but you can deal, you're brilliant, you're strong, you're proud, and I think you should live in the dorm with, with everybody else. That is not the case with all people and all of the reasons somebody would want to have a bubble. But I think that there are times when the bubble is perhaps dangerous. That's my wishy-washy answer <laughs> to you. Oh, it is on? It's on now? Okay. Um, I really like your diagnosis of the contemporary problems resulting from um, a pre-modern anthropomorphic mindset. But it seems to me we didn't just accidentally slide into that. It's actually been assertively pushed uh, in academia through the movement called postmodernism. Uh, they see what it is that they reject. Uh, they announce it. They come right out and say it. And uh, the influence of that movement is, is I think, still very, very strong in academia. Uh, how do you see us getting out of that or beyond that and getting a return to something that's less of a uh, anthropomorphic, I would say, conspiratorial mindset at all times? You know, honestly, you're right. I mean, postmodernism is all of this. It used to be that it was something that you found in certain corners of a university, in certain disciplines. And now we're dealing with that way of looking at things under different labels creeping into all of society. From what I'm seeing in academia, including in linguistics, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that it can be changed. It's getting to the point where the people minted in that kind of thinking are going to be doing all the hiring. Those people are beginning to have gray hair. And I'm not sure what can be done. I'm increasingly thinking that our whole sense of academia and universities as being where our highest order of thinking happens might have to change. And that depresses me, but modern technology is such that, and I don't mean this facetiously, you can get a very good education from podcasts, certain podcasts. You can get an education now with your phone that was impossible, say, 30 years ago. I'm glad of that because I think there are a lot of things that say Wondrium courses, the great courses can teach you that you might not get at many universities these days. I am as worried about that as you. I miss, when I used to teach at UC Berkeley, there were people like that. At any faculty meeting, if there were 15 people there, there were two people like that. That was great. Now it's becoming everybody who's running the country, depending on what, it, what institution you're thinking about. Yeah, it's a problem. Social media is good for it too. Right. Do we have any more any more questions from the audience? All right. All right. Well, let's uh, give uh, Professor McWhorter a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, folks.